Good afternoon. Last time I was in King's Great Hall, I was actually waitressing, um, which is physically a lot harder work than what I'm doing today, but rather less intimidating. Nevertheless, I'm very grateful to be invited. Thank you. Could I have my slides, please? Thanks. I want to talk to you about the impact of inequality, and I want to talk about it in a particular and perhaps rather peculiar context, that of the rich market developed economies. This is a chart showing life expectancy. Does this work? Apparently not. Try this one. Life expectancy up the sides, so ranging from 40 to 80 years. And it probably, to you, looks like smoke coming out of a chimney, but all those little blurs are the names of different countries. And it's plotted against national income per person across the bottom. And you can see that among the developing and emerging economies, as countries get richer, life expectancy improves rapidly. But beyond a certain point of economic development, that relationship is lost, and there's no further benefit to increased material living standards among the rich countries. And if we plotted happiness up the y-axis, you'd see exactly the same pattern. So we, in the rich countries, have got to the end of what economic growth can do for us in terms of health and happiness. And we're the first generation for whom that's really true. For all of human history, the best way to improve the quality of human life has been to improve material living standards. That's no longer true for these countries up here. And here they are. Here are, I think, 23 of the rich market democracies. Again, we've got life expectancy up the side. Again, plotted against national income per person. So those are just those countries on that flat part of the curve. Um, the incomes are in converted to purchasing power parities, so everybody can buy the same. And here in these rich countries, Norway, USA, they're about twice as wealthy as these countries at the other end, Israel, Greece, and Portugal. No relationship with life expectancy whatsoever. But we know that within every single one of those countries, there is a social gradient in health. Something like this. These are electoral wards for England and Wales. Over here, the most affluent, here, the most deprived. Again, life expectancy in years up the side. There's a seven and a half year gap in the life expectancy between the poorest areas and the wealthiest. But it isn't just a difference between the poor and the rest of us. It's a gradient that runs all the way across. So even if you're just a little bit below the top, your life expectancy is shorter on average than if you live in the very most affluent areas. And these gradients are true for a whole range of health and social problems that afflict our modern societies. We see social gradients in a whole range of health and social problems, and yet we see no effect of income levels between countries and only within. And this tells us that we're dealing with relativities, the importance of relative income, the importance of relative social status. It's not about absolute standards of living. It's not about what you can buy. It's about the meaning of income for people and the meaning of their social position. Um, in our book, um, referred to earlier, the spirit level, what we did was we went out to look for data on the health and social problems that concern us most in societies. Things like teenage pregnancies, kids dropping out of school, the um, appalling waste of human capital that Rob was referring to earlier. We looked for data that was comparable across these rich market democracies. We wanted really good data and we wanted to put it all together. We put it into an index. It's a very simple index, much simpler than most economists would think was acceptable, I'm sure. But it contains data on life expectancy for different countries, the maths and literacy scores of 15-year-olds, infant mortality rates, rates of murder and imprisonment, teenage births, levels of trust, obesity, mental illness, which includes um, drug and alcohol addiction in the figures we use, and for a few countries, social mobility. Put them all together in an index. If you're higher up on the y-axis, you're doing worse. If you're low down, you're doing better. Again, plotted against national income per person. No relationship whatsoever. Nothing going on. It looks just like that picture I showed you before for life expectancy. But if we plot the exact same index against a measure of income inequality of distribution rather than averages, that's what we get. 
looks more like physics with a bit of measurement error than anything in the social sciences. Countries at the top that are most unequal, UK, New Zealand, Portugal, USA, a higher prevalence of health and social problems, the more equal countries down here, Japan and the Nordics, doing so much better. Now, the measure we're using along the bottom here is the ratio of the incomes of the top fifth of the population to the bottom fifth. We use that mostly because we were writing our book for a popular audience. We wanted a measure of income inequality that people can understand. On this measure, the more equal countries, Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the rich have about three and a half to four times the income of the bottom fifth, the poorest fifth. And in the most unequal countries, Australia, the UK, Portugal, and the USA, it's seven to eight and a half times. Occasionally, we have data for Singapore, and in Singapore, it's nine times. So that's the scale of inequality that we're talking about. Now, we knew that this was politically sensitive stuff, and we didn't want to be accused of having picked our countries to suit our argument, although we do describe, I can describe to you the method by which we picked them. But we thought we'd repeat it all again in an independent setting. So we did it all again for the 50 states of the USA, look exa looking at exactly the same issue. Do the more unequal states have more health and social problems? We created the same index, and we used the um, census data um, on income inequality. It's the household, the Gini coefficient for household incomes. And again, a statistically significant higher level of health and social problems in the more unequal US states. And in case you thought we picked our problems to suit our argument, we did it all again with someone else's index. This is the UNICEF index of child well-being, one of the few measures on which the UK actually takes the lead over the USA in doing worse. It contains 40 components, every aspect of child well-being that you can think of. And in the more equal countries, child well-being is significantly higher than in the more unequal countries. I don't have time to show you a lot of the individual components of these indices, but I'll show you one or two. These are levels of trust in different countries from the World Values Survey. In the more equal countries, around two-thirds of the population feel they can trust one another. In the more unequal ones, it's less than a fifth. In US, ooh. I thought I had the states as well. It's a similar prevalence in the states from your general social survey. In the more equal states, around two-thirds of people trust one another, less than a third in the more unequal ones. And this is indicative of what inequality is doing to the social fabric. It's tearing apart the social cohesion of societies. Here's mental illness. In the more equal countries, fewer than 10% of the adult population with mental illness in the previous year. In Australia and the UK, 23%, and in the USA, more than one in four. The scale of these differences tells you something important. It shows you that what you're seeing here is not a problem confined to the poor, not a problem confined to some ethnic minority or some unusual subgroup of society. It affects all of us. Data from colleagues in Canada on the homicide rates for US states and Canadian provinces. The provinces are triangles down here, the states are dots. In the more equal Canadian states, around 15 murders per million people per year. In the most unequal US states, it's 150. Tenfold differences strongly correlated with inequality. And we see this pattern again and again for problem after problem in both rich countries and US states. We also find that the impact of inequality, although it is strongest among the poor, extends all the way up society, so it is affecting whole societies. These are mortality rates for US counties, and here for counties in the more equal states, and there for counties in the less equal states. And you can see that in the poorer counties, it's definitely better to live in a more equal state. But the benefits of being in a more equal state extend all the way up to the very most affluent counties of all. A similar pattern here for education. These are literacy scores for young adults um, arranged according to their parents' level of education. So here, at this end, the more uneducated parents, kids in Sweden do better than those in Canada, about the middle of the income distribution, and in the United States, much worse. But those differences, although diminishing, extend all the way up 
the social gradient. So that even among the most educated parents, kids do better in more equal Sweden than in the more unequal USA. And we have evidence from a number of different studies showing this pattern again and again, that the impact of inequality is felt even by the well-educated and the well-off. I also want to make a link between inequality and issues to do with sustainability and coping with climate change. And although our politics at the moment is dominated by the global economic crisis, I think over the next couple of decades, it is going to become increasingly dominated by the need to cope with climate change. And we think that greater equality has a lot to offer here to societies as they attempt to deal with that challenge. And that's in three ways. The first is that more unequal societies create greater status hierarchies and therefore more status competition and therefore more consumerism. People work longer hours, they get into debt more because they need to purchase things because status matters more. If we want sustainable economies and to rein in carbon emissions, we have to rein in consumerism and greater equality may be leverage for achieving that. The second way relates to what I showed you about trust and social cohesion. That doesn't only matter for social relationships with indivi with, between individuals, it seems to affect how more and less equal countries deal with their counterparts and deal with the planet. In more equal societies, people recycle more. More equal societies are significantly more likely to donate more in foreign aid, to score higher on the global peace index, to be less aggressive. They emit less carbon. And even their business leaders are more likely to say that their governments should comply with international environmental agreements. So more equal societies appear to be less out for themselves, not only in their intimate one-to-one -one relationships, but how they interact with other nations. And the third way in which greater equality has something to offer us as we cope with climate change comes in the realm of innovation. Now, it is a long-held popular myth that you need some hierarchy to create some aspiration, to create innovation and creativity. It's not true. We looked at a measure of innovation, patents granted per capita, or patents for the Americans among you, and the relationship is the other way around. There is a significantly higher granting of patents per capita in the more equal countries than in the less equal ones, probably related to the waste of human capital and potential in more unequal countries where kids drop out of school, achieve less educationally, and social mobility is much, much lower. When we picked this cartoon to go in our book, it was before the banking crisis, but I think he does look rather like a banker, this man, and he's talking to the kids sitting on his knee and he's saying, it goes in cycles, Junior. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Sometimes the rich get richer and the poor stay the same. It's not really good enough. Jamie showed you trends over a long time. This is just the trend in income inequality for Great Britain over the past couple of decades, um, indexed to 1979. See a massive rise in inequality through the 80s and early 90s, and very little done to um, reverse that trend since. We hear the term broken Britain in our politics a lot in the UK at the moment. If you look at this chart, you might ask, if it's broken, who broke it, and who didn't fix it? But this slide also offers a, a helpful message, as does the work Jamie has shown you. The inequality present in a country isn't a static characteristic of national culture or the way things always have been. It's not unchangeable. Countries become more equal, they become less equal. They shift, they move. And I think that gives us optimism for change. Um, look around you at this hall. It's amazing, isn't it? It is a center, or has been in the past, of great wealth, representative of huge class and wealth disparities. It's an amazing place. But when I was here at Cambridge in the 1980s, Kings was known as the People's Republic of Kings. The student union actually voted that the union leader must change his name from Sean Waterman to Sean Waterperson. 
It was a radical place then. Places can change, societies can change, and thinking can change. The great social movements of the 20th century haven't been decided upon by politicians or even academics. They've been driven by social movements and people requiring change. We're at an important moment in history where there is space for debate about what our economies should look like, how they should be structured, who they work for. The economic crisis is also an opportunity for real new thinking about how we make economies work for people and not vice versa. Thank you.